Am I, are we good to go? I think we are. So everybody, this is Casey. She owns Mount, Mountain Laurel Digital, which is a digital marketing firm. And she's going to help us a lot today with SEO and AI. And she can tell us more about it. Yay. Thanks for the intro. Mm -hmm. I will share my screen real quick. Let me close my email. So I'm about this. Okay. Do a little slide share. Can you guys see my screen okay? Awesome. Well, thanks for having me guys today. I love Shop Local Raleigh. I've been following you guys a long time. <laughs> um, as especially as a consumer who really loves to shop local, you guys have been a great resource. So thank you. And as a mom, I'm always looking for local kids, kid shops too. <laughs> Um, cool. So diving right in, I really love to talk about SEO from a business strategy lens, because I think a lot of times SEO gets siloed into this like keyword tactics bucket, but it's really meant to be, you know, a part of the bigger picture for, in order for it to be successful. So I like to go back to the like business side of things and like making that decision to have an SEO strategy so that it can evolve with the business and be valuable um, versus kind of being on an island, which I think is a, a typical thing for SEO. Like put the keywords, the tags, um, I try to talk about it more holistically. So in starting off, SEO can do certain things. It can also not do certain things. Um, we're also going to talk about AI and how the bigger changes that have happened to the SERP in the past, I don't know, three months, um, really since the beginning of the year, um, especially, and how it's been changing SEO and how it functions. Um, so just start off business goals, things that we like to kind of measure back from a KPI, like key performance perspective. Like if you're a marketer or a small business owner, when you're thinking about investing in your SEO strategy, thinking about business goals. So Typically, people are looking at increasing quality of sales versus lead gen for SEO, um, because typically when you're investing in SEO, it's because the leads that you're getting are not high quality. Um, more than likely, people are coming to your site, but they're not the people you want. So a lot of times investing in SEO helps you get more clarity on what kind of quality leads you want to your website. Um, advancing the brand's perspective in the market. So we like to be a brand forward SEO agency um, and like how we're doing SEO is very brand forward, especially now with AI, which I'll talk about, but essentially advancing a brand's perspective in the market, um, doing that through content. And I'll talk about how to do that. But these are just some goals, high level goals to think about when you're investing time and money into SEO, earning brand equity. Um, again, something that AI cannot do for a brand um, and essentially kind of investing in PR is basically where that kind of falls in and kind of like showing people that are coming to your site that you're worth, um, you're, you're a worthy resource, essentially. Um, what can SEO do? SEO is a tactic. It's not a business goal. That's why I like to start with business goals because SEO is not like you know, a, a goal is not doing SEO better. SEO is an activity to get to a goal. And I think that can cause some confusion sometimes. <laughs> um, attracting searchers that you want. So people that are, are searching for what you do or what you're providing as a product, um, you that's where brand comes in. Obviously, you want to stand out. And that's where social media comes in um, and building that community of people that you want to be looking for you. Um, controlling how your brand is seen in search results. This has gotten more technical, I think. I mean, it's always been technical, but I think that there's a misunderstanding around it because how the brand is seen in search can actually be controlled in a lot of ways that I think is forgotten. So there's something that we'll talk about today called schema markup and rich snippets um, and knowledge graph. And those will be some technical terms I'll go into in regards to some development that you can do on the back end. Um, and there's lots of resources out there. You don't have to be a full stack programmer to implement schema, but essentially what it does on the back of a page is marking up certain pieces of the page so that Google can crawl it faster um, and ideally uh, rank it for more of those question and answer boxes that you see in search results. 
um, nudging searchers towards queries you want them to see. Um, so what we do here is essentially, I'll be talking about this, but like ideally you have pillar pages, like priority web pages on your site that you want to drive people towards versus just the home page. Um, so like if you're targeting terms to come up in organic search, um, and your and their terms that you want someone to take an activity, for instance, on that page. If you're ranking your home page, you're already creating a roadblock for them to getting to a page. So essentially, SEO helps you um, position certain landing pages for a query versus just the home page. Um, so further down the funnel in that decision making. Um, and then going back to marketing goals, what SEO can do: build brand awareness grow traffic, attract ready to buy visitors, earn traffic from high demand searches, ideally lower competition. Um, that's faster. You can compete for terms, but it just takes longer. So we try to compete more on terms and opportunities that have been missed by competition because you're more likely to rank for those quicker. Um, and then as you slowly rank for those higher competition terms. Um, building content with links to rank up. Um, so we've talked, we'll talk about this a little bit, but essentially looking at like .gov, .edu, websites that have, um, you know, a lot of credibility and figuring out how to build content that will attract those kind of partnerships. Um, what SEO cannot do, grow search demand. So this is kind of a, a something that I think gets confused. Um, if, if you want to rank for a term or you have a product that you want to rank for, and that product or that service doesn't have demand, SEO can't change that for you. And, and I think like that's like a, a disruptive conversation sometimes. Um, we talk with some, you know, especially startup people that have like a concept and, you know, essentially doing market research, seeing that there's not a demand and SEO can't, can't, can't change that. So that's something to consider when, when you're thinking about starting a business or a concept, like doing market research to determine there's an actual demand, um, because SEO can't fix that. Um, build, building a brand or a brand perceptions on its own. So when we're working with a brand, then we're doing SEO, uh, we're, you know, doing, taking the initiative to do things to grow the organic search presence. But if they're not doing social media, if they're not doing some sort of paid advertising, if there's not a mixed channel, it's it's pretty hard to build the brand. Um, the, so with SEO, SEO with a brand that's established, it's a lot different than doing SEO for a brand that's not established. So like if we're working with a new brand, there usually has to be a mix of other marketing <laughs> pieces happening in order for the SEO to really grow at the level that we want it to. Whereas like a brand that's really established, they can actually lean into their brand name and generate a lot of organic traffic based on their brand name. Um, it's just, you know, if you know about something, it's, it's going to grow faster. Um, direct, directly convert customers if the website does not satisfy the searcher. Um, so this is where like user experience comes into play. Um, and it's honestly why we've become full service. <laughs> Because uh, when I started our firm, I was an SEO freelancer and I would have to partner with developers and designers a lot to um, to make sure that the work I was doing was converting um, because SEO doesn't convert customers. Um, what's called conversion rate optimization, on-page work, um, like basically changing design to meet what the funnel needs when you're bringing traffic to the page. That's what converts the SEO. Um, anyways, these are just a lot of like <laughs> areas I think that cause a lot of confusion on what SEO is, what it does, and what it doesn't do. Um, before I go, do you guys have any questions, thoughts? I know I kind of went on a philosophical tangent um, <laughs> on SEO um, versus the technical terms, but no, okay. Um, so this gets more into like the implementation side of SEO. So, um, and I just want to give a shout out to, to one of our team members, Danielle Magner. She helped also with a lot of this research. We've done presentations like this a lot, um, but we do a lot of it collaboratively. Um, and so I just wanted to mention her really quick because she helped with some of this content. Um, so starting with priority pages, um, I think a lot of times on-site SEO can take 
it can be overwhelming because there's so many different things you can do. So we always like to start with priority pages and we categorize priority pages by how much traffic they're getting. Like if they're not getting a lot of traffic, it's, it's, it's going to take longer for you to get value out of doing SEO on them. So it's really good to prioritize pages on your website that are already getting traffic, potentially already ranking, um, and also like demonstrating lead value for you. Like you're already getting business out of those pages. Um, it's better to just invest in pages that are already working for you to start because you can also get more data and test things quicker. Um, and consider, you know, highly important blogs, um, and then kind of at, at, at some point transferring what you've learned on those higher traffic pages to lower priority pages. Um, and then addressing metadata. So um, there is on-site SEO called title tags and meta descriptions. I would say it's kind of the most basic on-site SEO that any pretty much anyone can do on a site. I think the piece that makes it more technical is the research and like establishing a good group of terms that you want to target in regards to the audiences you're targeting. So I think that's where it gets more technical, but the actual implementation is pretty straightforward. Squarespace, WordPress, Shopify, um, um, even Wix all have like SEO applications on the back end where you can select a title tag and meta description. Um, and you can customize all of those. So in the search results, you'll see the title tag above the URL link and then the meta description underneath. Um, these are a part of the algorithm. The meta descriptions actually are not. The meta descriptions are really more just landscape that you can utilize um, to kind of address questions. It's basically like a social media caption for your URL. Um, the title tag is still pretty important, um, but I would say it's changing a lot right now <laughs> um, because how Google is deciding how to populate the title tag is changing real time right now. Um, but I, we still use our existing framework, which is like trying to stay within a character count that comes up in the search results and then targeting like one primary term in the title tag and a secondary term. Um, and then if we can fit the brand in there, great, but it, that has become less important. Um, considering copy on the page, uh, customizing um, the copy on the page to kind of improve engagement. Um, what we've kind of found is really looking at the trending questions. So when you do manual searches, I'm sure you guys are aware, you'll see auto suggest, and that is essentially what people are searching the most. Like when you type in a query in the search engine, it'll populate like all the recently searched things in regards to that topic. So that alone will tell you a little bit about what's trending in regards to that topic. Um, and then at the bottom of the search results, there's also like groupings of terms that you can start with to kind of see how people are searching for that topic. Um, and since the search is changing a lot, one of the big things that the search is changing in regards to content is more topical. So you'll see there's like question and answer boxes. <laughs> yes, it's going in that direction of conversation. It always has been, but what it's called is natural language, natural language, machine learning, basically leaning into, um, uh, you know, how you would talk to a human. <laughs> and, and it's always been going that direction, but I would say like now it's exponentially like changing interface to meet that, um, expectation. Um, but there's all these other things are still really important. It's just kind of thinking more, um, you know, not just context heavy, but also um, interpersonal almost like tone and brand is going to become even more important, I think, in how we write content. Um, so these are just some kind of best, like top, top ways to optimize content. So figuring out like, how to prioritize content based on what you're ranking for. Like we talked about um, topic expansion. Um, so like what topics that you're talking about that you can deepen um, and kind of refresh and looking at what's coming up in search that's better than your content. Um, exploring, um, you know, best practices in regards to like where the terms are that you're targeting. Um, as far as like keyword injection, you know, I think like over the years, keyword injection has really changed in regards to like 
put a keyword here, put a keyword there, put a keyword here. It's just, it's a lot smarter than that now. And that's, it's, that just doesn't work like it used to. It, and honestly, rightfully so, because it usually hurts the copy experience. So I think in regards to like integrating keywords into copy, what we've seen the best is just thinking about like utilizing those terms as you would in natural language. Um, um, and thinking about the intent behind how the term is used, like, is your audience looking for how something is done or why something is done? You know, think, thinking more in regards to that conversational element in how you're writing copy, I think is really leaning into how the AI is impacting search. Um, in regards to kind of optimizing the page and how it works and functions, um, this is just kind of some, some uh, high level questions to ask yourself. Um, in regards to how you're thinking about content, like how the keywords relate to the answers, where are you putting call to actions? Like, are you putting them high on the page, low on the page? Are you focused on mobile users? Should the design focus on the scrollability of the page? Things like that. Um, and you can kind of see other ideas like the URL. How is the URL structured? Is it easy to understand? Is it a bunch of numbers? Like keeping things really clean and sleek and just, you know, thinking about what's going to be the easiest function, especially since um, users are just fast, like using things faster and faster and faster with this new chat interface. Um, search, search satisfaction is actually a signal in the algorithm, <laughs> which is fascinating. It just shows you how smart things are getting on the search engine side. Um, and when I say search satisfaction, it's essentially like um, the algorithm is kind of um, catering to signals around like how long people are staying on the page, if they're coming back to the page. Um, you know, is it fast? Are they staying on the, like site speed is a big piece of search satisfaction. I know it seems small, um, but it's actually challenging to have a website that's high speed now because a lot of sites are so image heavy and video heavy, and that really drags down site speed. Um, and I think like the cool factor has been an element of the responsive design movement, <laughs> which also hinders the functionality side. So I think there's still a lot of opportunities for brands to kind of lean into function um, in regards to speed, um, because we we audit a lot of websites and that's usually the primary issue <laughs> is site speed. Um, and that causes a lot of issues for rankings if the site is not moving very quickly and loading properly. Um, solving um, for new tasks, so like questions, tools, resources, staying on the website versus more searching. Um, so that's what Google also signals for like being a rich snippet. So like a featured answer at the top of search has a lot to do um, with how often people are utilizing that resource over and over and over. Um, creative elements are, um, in our experience, seem to help because it differentiates the content if you're ranking like on the top of the first page for a question that's asked regularly in your space, but say you don't have a cool resource that can be downloaded or yeah, I, lent, I listed like interactive maps are huge. Um, sorting and filtering is something we do a lot in regards to like how easy it is to find the answers. Um, and then obviously interactive imagery is very and cool now, <laughs> like cool factor is a piece there in regards to competing with other content. Um, so the goal ultimately is you do not want to give a searcher a reason to go back to the internet and select a different site for their question. This tells Google your site is not doing a good job answering queries and will likely push your site down in the search. So um, cool, measuring your targeting strategy. So one thing that we talk a lot about with our clients is creating a, a measurement environment <laughs> because you do all this work and you don't know if it's working. Um, so obviously we do still track keywords, even though they kind of are considered an outda outdated metric to track um, because really it's, it's it, it, because keyword data is so there's so many discrepancies around like how often a term is searched. So we have paid tools that will tell us how often to search. You have like research around how people are searching 
but at the end of the day, like it's, it's still hard to tell, like if it's just impressions or if they're driving leads. So traffic and analytics is really the best way to get information to determine if your what you're doing is working. Um, we still track terms because it's a nice data point. That's how I see keyword tracking as a data point. Um, and so in Google Analytics, you can actually split channel distribution. Um, and there's a report tool called Looker tool, Looker Reports. It's, it used to be called Google Studio. Now it's called Looker. I don't know why. That doesn't make any sense. But <laughs> they're called Looker Studio Reports, and they're awesome. You can customize them. Um, obviously, everyone is probably aware that Google Analytics 4 is like the new platform for analytics. And then the universal analytics is going away in July. So we have been doing tons of migrations for clients, especially in the e-commerce space. Um, one of the big things from analytics, this is probably a whole other session, but the analytics side is that you'll start to notice in Google Analytics 4 that it tracks differently because of privacy settings. And so there's a lot of data that's not being tracked now in Google Analytics 4. So it's unfortunate because without that data, it does look like traffic is going down, right? Because it's not counting a lot of traffic that Google Analytics 4 or you know, you know, Universal Analytics was tracking. So when you're comparing data, just take it with a grain of salt, um, because I think that a lot of the data for the next year or so in analytics is going to be a little bit hard to discern. Um, yeah, and then these are kind of some metrics that we typically manage, like um, landing pages, where are they exiting, where are they entering, um, form fills, of course, like what traffic is, what medium of traffic is driving those form submissions, things like that. If you're doing geo-targeting or geofencing of any kind with paid advertising, we do break down by geographic, things like that. Um, it's essentially story building, like how, what story do you want to tell with your data? And then like discerning like what kind of metrics you need to customize um, within your tracking. Um, as far as like flagging things, so flagging when optimizations are not working and how to identify. Um, essentially looking at your goals, going always going back to your goals, and then looking at what queries are most important for you. So one of the things that we've noticed over the years in regards to kind of the fluctuations in performance is that a lot of times it does have to do with market shifts, especially over the past three to four years and just current events that have happened in a lot of different spaces um, and just like economic changes and things like that. We actually go a lot back to keywords and semantics around like people's search behaviors are changing. So I think going back in and looking at your full marketplace when you're seeing like, I mean, extreme dips, like nothing like 15, 20% traffic dips, I feel like are kind of just par for the course typically. But if you're seeing like extreme dips in traffic or just like a flat lead submission, those kind of things, um, I think it's good to kind of look at the competitive space as a whole and seeing what like big changes are happening in search behaviors. Um, and a way to do that is actually using a tool called uh, Google Search Console, because um, you can actually see Google Search Console is a free tool. I like to call it um, the website health monitor, because what it does, is it kind of alerts you to um, things like, this is more like when you're trying to manage the security of your site, but malware, security issues, which can also really affect your traffic too if you get hit by spam. But it's a great tool, free tool that you can add to your site and kind of see search demand around keywords and click through rates. It'll actually show you like click through rates on terms. So you can actually see if like certain keywords are no longer performing for the marketplace. Um, Cause that's that's been a thing, especially the past three to four years that I've been <laughs> doing this. Um, okay, link earning. So this is uh, categorized as off-site SEO, so not on the site. Um, why are quality out, outbound links important? Um, I think probably everyone on this call, being that we are all in media, essentially, um, understand the quality of link earning. And I like to call it link earning, not link building. I'm mean, like, that's done. <laughs> um, people still do it, but I... I think that it, I'm hoping that it'll really be laid to rest after AI because 
people aren't going to put up with buying links anymore, but we'll see. <laughs> Link earning is essentially building relationships with media outlets, um, media outlets that fit your brand, media outlets that um, give your brand exposure, um, and also link to your content. Um, so these are really relationship building, but also doing your research on like what kind of websites you want promoting your business. Um, and then also being really cautious about not linking to websites that could potentially harm your website. So like if a website's just sitting and not being managed, um, it's concerning to you if they link back to you. So I think one thing that doesn't get talked about enough, we, we actually have clients send us links and making sure we check them before they do any kind of link backs. Um, because I think a lot of people don't realize how how a site can get hacked very, it can easily get hacked sometimes if it's not being managed and then affect links. So um, I think there's like a process going into like deciding on how we want to link. Directories are great, just like shop local Raleigh. Um, for a, small businesses, of course, it's a great fit. Um, and then content distribution, um, like writing blogs for other hosts and things like that. Oh, I see a trap. Yay. Okay. Um, and then obviously basic tip, you know, editorial nature, diverse domains, um, competitor links. So one thing that we like to do is, you know, for our clients is look at their competitors and look at what's called um, a link back profile. And so you can essentially see what, what all of their media outlets that they've prioritized for their business and then kind of see if there's opportunities for you. Because more than likely, if your competition is doing it, it's a good call. Um, cool. Okay, this goes back to website functionality again, because it's so important. Um, Google Search Console is another tool that will help you in regards to accessibility. So accessibility in regards to SEO um, is super important and sometimes gets missed, especially when you're launching a new website. Um, because a lot of times you'll have a site on staging and it's not indexed. So it's important to kind of have a quality assurance to make sure the site gets indexed so that Google can find it and crawl it and crawl all the pages. Um, another thing that I see regularly with this is response codes. So for instance, if you're a product-based business and you're constantly updating your product inventory, um, you need to make sure that you redirect like what's called a 301 redirect where you temporarily redirect it um, to a, a new page um, so that Google can find it. It's essentially saying like telling Google that you've moved to a new URL. Um, this is all development related. So this typically does require a developer, but they're very simple updates for any front end developer um, primarily. But it's it's really just making sure Google can find the site. And a quick way to determine if your site is not being found by Google because of um, technical errors is doing something called a site query where you just type in your search, uh, your search query bar, site colon, no space, and then your domain. And it'll actually populate all the pages that Google can see. Um, and if it populates just your homepage, that's a sign that Google may be having trouble finding your site. Um, cool. I think I'm going to keep moving. Okay. So structured data, this goes into the schema markup piece. So I'm going to actually go ahead and show you guys what that is. So there's lots of different schema. Um, organization schema is kind of the basic or local business schema for, I think, all of our local business people. Um, this is essentially a, implementing a small, um, markup and I can, I can share, this is more development heavy, but um, there's a site called schema.org and you can actually copy and paste like their schema for like framework um, and then just update it for your business. So if you go to like schema.org local business, it's actually templated already for you. So you can just update that piece of code um, and usually recommend putting it in the header. Um, but yeah, this is just like small ways, natural, natural language of like meeting um, the search engines where it's at so that it can understand what you want to, to highlight. So it essentially helps highlight the information. Um, so this goes into the AI effects. So just again, SEO is still a very much important part of your marketing. Um, search engines are definitely evolving. Um, the biggest updates have been the Magi project and BARD. The Magi project is essentially, this came out, the news came out last month and it's in beta now. Um, and you can sign up to test it. I've tested a little bit. It's essentially like an outside app from Google. Um, 
it's a Google app basically, and it's working on a co the code name is Magi. Who knows what it'll become? But essentially, it's just trying to catch up because Microsoft Bing put one out, and it's just a big competition between the giants essentially, and we're just trying to follow it. But um, from what I've seen from it so far, uh, and I'll show you guys kind of a screenshot of kind of how they're saying it's going to function. It's it's kind of it's just more rapid responses, kind of just like a chatbot. bot. Um, so this is kind of like a preview of what it'll probably look like. You've probably already noticed changes in your SERP, um, but it generally it's just it's just more and more like a chat box. Um, but again, it, this is still a site that's pro like providing this information. So it's still like optimizing the website. It's just more going to be more granular in regards to how you're optimizing it. All right, I'm going to stop talking. Do you guys have any questions? I have a little bit more, but I actually don't know what time it is. <laughs> You're actually good to keep going if you've got more. This is interesting. Okay, cool. All right. Well, then going more into natural language, um, as far as tactics. So we've been compiling a, you know, a list of different tactics and ways to kind of like, you know, get ahead of it as it's going to continue to evolve. So focusing on optimizing for natural language with rich snippets and structured data, like I spoke to, just go to schema.org. Um, or Google structured data. I can include these links too when I send this over um, to the team. But the I think the biggest thing in regards to answering questions outside of the development side of the site and working on the code side um, is the Q&A boxes. Um, so like you'll see on the first page of the results, typically they had frequently asked questions. I noticed they now have a second box recently in some of my SERPs. Um, cause you're going to get different search results every time. And because it's all being tested right now, the interface changes that are happening. So there's like another box question, they have question, uh, frequently asked questions box. And now they've started testing like another question answer box. So that's like half of the first page. <laughs> so I think like what we're, what we're seeing and what I'm reading too, is that they're likely going to get rid of the blue links, um, and it's going to start feeling less and less like a, a list of URLs and more and more like a list of answers. Um, and so that's what we're seeing. Again, it's all being tested. Like users may hate it and they might take it back, you know, um, which is honestly, I think, possible. It's similar to like, you know, Facebook changing their interfaces um, as well and like people hating it and having to retract and test. So that's why I'm like, take all this as a grain of salt because this is all just things that they're testing in the interfaces right now. I think in regards to tactical marketing, though, and thinking about how to still utilize SEO as a valuable channel to receive leads and new business is just going to be about being the best resource there is. Um, working on content topical ideation. So one thing that we've been doing here is leaning more into current events. So like we work um, with professional development, um, a company that focuses on professional development and trainings. And so we we put together like a ton of research around um, topics that they could write about or refurbish and um, taking questions around AI actually, <laughs> um, because there's so much talk about AI taking people's jobs um, and kind of leaning more into trends, like really is what you should always be doing in regards to topic ideation and utilizing content in regards to how you're answering questions in the search results. But I think making it more timely is going to be important um, be, because essentially when you you see how you know the AI is functioning it, it does seem like how they're leaning into it it does seem that it's around trends more and more around trends so the more you can get into the conversation around what's trending and then ideally leading that trending conversation within your space again intent and like coming at it from the right lens and the lens that's going to make you the best resource, I think that's feeding into the AI strategy, like merging SEO and, and, SE, and AI. Um, narrowing down the metadata strategies. So instead of like focusing, and we've been doing this for years, but I think it's just gonna keep going in this direction. Instead of just going after broad terms, like really competitive, like, you know, um, I don't know, uh, 
affordable, um, uh, let's see, uh, affordable uh, residential homes or something like that. Like that's super competitive and you know, you're probably coming up for Wikipedia stuff. Thinking more in terms of like strategy around your keyword groupings um, around not just long tail terms, because I know we've all heard that's important, but more of like the question and how the questions are being asked um, so that you come up for that question. The natural language thing, I keep bringing it up, but I think like instead of doing title tags and meta descriptions around like keywords that have a lot of traffic, taking those terms that get a lot of traffic and then incorporating them into more of a conversational target, I think is where metadata will be headed. Um, increasing PR efforts. Um, so I link build, link earning uh, continues to honestly be a big part of the algorithm. And I don't see that going away with these updates um, because they're only increasing, um, like, you know, when you see top, like top PR firms, um, and like how, especially service-based industries, if they're being ranked as the best in town, you know, they're going to keep being ranked well. Okay, conversational keyword. Um, so think of it in regards to like when you're having a conversation, um, especially a consultative conversation. So like uh, say, hmm, I'm trying to think from like a local business perspective, like say you're a flower shop, for instance, and like you have, you only sell native plants. So you're trying to target a person that cares about buying a native plant versus, you know, I don't know, a plant that will survive in their house, <laughs> you know? Um, and so like maybe uh, thinking about providing a resource for someone that already knows a thing or two about what a native plant needs. Um, and so like asking, and it's like basically having a more educated uh, question or educated uh, targeted phrase. Um, so like taking um, native plant and, you know, giving it more context on like how your audience is searching for native plants. So um, I am just making this up, but maybe they're asked, they want to buy a native plant locally, like, um, because they know that that's going to probably be more native than online. And so they want to go to a shop. And so more than likely they want to know about the owner. So like, well, uh, who's the most, um, like, what's the most uh, well-known native plant shop or uh, what, what is everybody like trying to, it's almost like connecting to a community, uh, versus just typing in a search result. Um, does that answer the question? <laughs> it's, it's hard to do without a like subject matter, but. Okay. Yeah, that helps. Okay. Um, okay. That's all the resources. Yeah. I, so I did link a lot of resources here. Um, and then this is the. This, re this uh, came out in February. This is kind of the, the full introduction around the new product. Uh, and it kind of goes into a lot around like context um, in regards to how you're answering questions. Yeah. I had a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know that I fully grasp all of the like implications of AI, but from what you're saying let, i wanted to like see if this is correct and then see how this applies to like local businesses so if ai is going to be used more and they're going to do this sort of chat thing where it's like what's um what's the best flower shop in raleigh and then you're going to get these results that google's going to give you based on just like anything it's pulling it's it could be pulling from an influencer's blog or like these top 10 lists about things like where to get Mother's Day gift guide on Shop Local Raleigh, right? So like those are going to be the results that are shown as the like AI response, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So mm -hmm. if you're a flower shop, are you going to have to start, I mean, we already know that like it's just a good practice to to be creating blogs and content about like here are our five top picks for Mother's Day plants for this season or this time of year or whatever it may be. But then 
like do you need to be changing that type of content as well because you know you're like competing with almost the way that the AI is searching now? I don't know if I'm even asking that correctly or not. Yeah, I think I know what you're saying. Um, I think it's going to go back to what the search results are doing um, for the more like traditional searches. So like where I like to start with that kind of question when I'm investigating the best tactic for for content and SEO is just going back to the basics and seeing like when I, if, as a searcher, if I was this person looking for the shop, going in and manually searching, honestly, and seeing what they're getting, and then seeing what that competitive landscape is doing, and who's being successful with that new, with the, the recent updates being made, and what they're doing differently. And, and what I've seen so far in regards to like, how things are getting ranked differently it just, it just seems a lot of like, who's answering the question best. So that's a tough one to like, say like, this is the tactic for that when it's such a contextual ask, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I mean, five years ago or however long ago, it's a game, right? They do a thing and then the market responds like, oh, well, we need a keyword in the H2 header of the thing. And then we need a keyword here and we need to like, and so then you write, in the format that you know is going to rank highest, right? Right. And so now, and then especially if the AI is responding, is it pulling when it shows you those bullet points, let's say it says five bullet points about Constellation, is it pulling from one source or multiple sources? My understanding is pulling from multiple sources. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's that's even more difficult to like show attribution Right. And then also more difficult to get someone to click because I have the answer in front of me right now. Why am I going to click? I know right. the five best flower shops or I know whatever. So, right. Yeah. Tracking is going to be a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Hey, can, I, can I piggyback on that? Yeah. So I'm curious, it relates to what Seth is asking and Casey, what you're describing on Google today. I mean, clearly it's not the AI piece, but when you search, like this morning, I searched for how to have an application on my Mac open on the, on the display that I want, right? And when I searched for that today, it didn't give me a list of websites. It gave me a snippet of someone's website that had the answer to my question. So I realized it's not AI, but it's kind of moving toward what you're describing, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. That, that schema markup, that's structured data, what you're talking about. So okay. more than likely that website, I'd have to look at it to confirm because there's two things that could be happening. The website that came up for the result that you were looking for in the snippet, um, either one has structured data um, highlighting that specifically on that page, or two, they have been just, you know, had basically the algorithm has decided they're the best resource. Um, gotcha. And I've, I've actually helped a few clients get featured snippets, and it takes a couple of years to typically. Gotcha. Yeah, so and, more than likely they focused on that piece of copy for many years to get into gotcha. the snippet. Okay, yeah. okay. And to Seth's point, I didn't have to click on that result to get to my answer. I already got my answer. That's so, true. Okay. So anyway, and they, just I'm sure they're still seeing a substantial amount of traffic from that page because it's always yeah. there. And they do that with YouTube videos too. Like that'll be part of your result. But do you want to watch this YouTube video at the seven minute mark? It's answering, you know, whatever you just asked. Yeah. Yeah. Video. Yeah. Video. So video search is completely different and image, gotcha. search, but yeah. So do you have any like predictions, which is, you know, this is a terrible question, but like, I mean, if we're now getting rid of the need to do a deep dive or click, and we're now taking all the different answers from, from the different sources and just putting them there and you're done, there's no clicking on that news article. There's no page view. There's no like ad revenue. What's, uh, is that the end of the internet? Like what? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I mean, this is just my personal opinion. I don't have data around this to back this opinion up, but I, I think there's still going to be a substantial need for additional research. Yeah. 
I don't yeah. think that's going away. Um, especially if you're making a purchase, you know, over, honestly, I, I do additional research or purchase over a hundred bucks. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I, I want to see a little bit more information before I yeah. spend on something. So I think I, I just don't see people not doing a little bit more research, especially on purchases or, or long-term decisions and things like that. Like we use the internet for so many incredibly important things and for decisions we make in life. I just can't imagine us. I hope like yeah, not yeah. diving a bit deeper in some of yeah. those things, you know, but yeah. Yeah, I guess I shouldn't say the end of the internet, maybe just like the news business, because if you're a news, oh, the news business, yeah, you're putting something, you know, but yeah, yeah I think that's this is a fair you know, question for the news, like media outlets. I mean, I don't know, because there's still some B2B investment in regards to that information too, right? Like funding, mm -hmm. uh, recognition, I could see some clicks from that kind of intent, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, just getting information. Yeah, there's definitely going to be a decline on the media side. That's a good call out. Um, I have a question. So if you're a small business with minimal budget, where would you put most of your energy, time, and funds when looking at optimizing your website and kind of SEO into your tactics? Yeah, I love that. Um, I think it's really about brand and what's most important for your brand in that small business space. Like for instance, um, since we're on the plant topic, like if you're a plant shop, I think aesthetically is really, really important for you. Um, so I think investing into, into the design and the aesthetic of the brand um, is going to be super high priority. Um, if you're an e-commerce website, um, you know, the customer checkout is going to be really important. So I think it's like, it's really not one answer for that because every small business has such different business initiatives that I feel like it goes back to like, what are your top three business initiatives? Like, why are you in business? You know, what, what is most important for your audiences and then choosing your marketing dollars that way. Um, because like, I don't think every channel mix is important. And I don't think every tactic for SEO is important for every small business. Um, so I think it just goes back to that and then making those decisions based off of that. I'm sorry, that was one of those, like, it depends answers. But <laughs> Does anyone here have, want to talk about their business in particular? A question along those lines? Yeah, Sarah, this is Lucas. I mean, your question was right on with what I was thinking of asking Casey the entire time, because uh, some of these small businesses, I was going to say we have a small budget. <laughs> to be blank and clear, we don't have the revenue to support some of the some yeah. of the work that we're talking about. Like I've talked to some uh, social experts in the past, you know, to get my business more socially out there. It's just so expensive, you know. To, to do that, that if I try that for six months and it doesn't work, there goes the business. Mm -hmm. So I am curious, you know, some folks like me use Shopify. I can't really adjust the checkout process from what I can tell, mm -hmm. other than you know, picking the colors and stuff like that. Uh, so around SEO, branding and social, is it futile for me to look at improving SEO if I'm not gonna do social, for example? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, we have a few clients that like their social budget went to SEO um, just because organic search was uh, driving more dollars than social was. Um, it's also a little easier to track SEO, honestly, than social um, just because you have you can use Google Analytics a little bit better there. Um, but like for a small Shopify website, typically what we recommend as far as like uh, kind of top priority SEO. I kind of um, hit on it. Um, and the stuff you can do in house, I'm sure, um, is like this priority pages thing. Like, what are your top selling products and spending your SEO time there versus your full shop, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And then just like optimizing those particular product pages. Because if you can get, you know, one product page to rank for that product term that people are searching for in your space and looking at competitors, and if you can get that one product listing to, to come up, 
and it's also a converting page, you kind of get your, your ROI there um, versus just getting the home page to rank and not really sure. And then having to redesign the home page so you're converting and driving people to the product page, it's a lot easier just to rank your product pages. That, that makes so much sense because I had issues like getting my reviews to show up on Google, you know, shopping.google.com. And so I just focus on my top three products as opposed to all my products. Yeah. Kind of similar thing, prioritize. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear you on the checkout though. We have hit that with Shopify too. It's frustrating. Yeah, I think my hands are tied with that for the most part. Yeah, I get that. That makes sense. I think um, Instagram shop is pretty helpful. We do paid advertising. Social media, I will say, I'm not a paid expert, but in my experience with being on a lot of campaigns, um, it does seem like you have to spend on social media now to get anything out of it, which is a bummer. Yeah. Yeah, and we tried that two years ago when the whole social atmosphere with Facebook and security of data kind of changed. And so we took a pretty big hit because we started during that period and didn't work out for us. You know, the ROI was just zero. And so we're really hesitant to pull the trigger on any social, you know, because you've got Google, you've got Facebook, you've got YouTube, you've got just so many things to spend money on. So yeah, we've seen really a good return on Pinterest. Um if you have some good recipe content, because we work with a lot of e-commerce brands and recipe content goes really well, or like content around the product that's not like directly selling um, that, you know, more lifestyle type of content because Pinterest mm -hmm. is a very expensive. Um, okay. Casey, I joined a, a minute late, so I don't know what company you're with, but I wonder if, oh, okay. offers, if you offer a consultations and maybe yeah. even hire your company to do some some work for us. Yeah, absolutely. Would love to talk. Yeah, I um I own Mountain Laurel Digital. Um, we're a full service digital marketing and creative agency. We started in Asheville, and I moved. I was kind of a spiel in the beginning, but I moved back. So I'm from the Triangle originally, but I've been living in the mountains for a few years and started the firm there. And now we're a remote agency, but we do have three people here in Raleigh now. We've been hiring. Great. Cool. Great. I'll, I'll look at the details, the contact information I'm sure is available. Thank you. Yeah. Casey, oh, yeah. if you want to drop your contact info in the chat box, and then if anybody would like to reach out. Thank you. Yeah. Does anyone gonna... else have any questions? Why like Casey's submitting some of her info in here. If not, that's okay. You're welcome to email them to us. We can get them to her or vice versa. Um, emails in the chat and we can put together a little blog post with all this information and with the links. So anybody here is well more than welcome to go back and view and listen to this later. Thanks for having me, you guys. It was really fun. It was, I love nerding out. <laughs> I was like, this is a fun platform. I just like talk about all the nerdy stuff that we never have time to talk about with clients. Well, this is fun too. I learned so much. I hope you all can say the same. Yeah. yeah right. Thank you, Casey. Really thank appreciate you. also your delivery style, Casey. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> good to see everyone. Have a good rest of your week. Thank you, Casey. You too. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you so much.